In the biblical tradition, all Jews and Christians are the descendants of Isaac. In Hebrew, the name Isaac means laughter. How would our world be different if we thought of ourselves as the children of laughter? It is an unfortunate myth that religion is all about being serious and stuffy instead. That's just not the way religion has to be. So, let us begin our service by invoking a spirit of divine laughter. We invoke trickster gods from the world's indigenous religious traditions. We invoke a pantheon that includes coyote and cocopelli, and raven and crow, Anansi and Loki. We invoke these divine tricks, jokesters and tricksters together. We invoke the wisdom contained in Greek tragedies and Shakespearean dramas in which wisdom and truth are so often dispensed by characters playing the role of the fool. And we invoke the truth tellers of today who appear in the guise of comedians. We invoke the poets who link religious ecstasy to laughter and reversal. We invoke the Sufi mystic poets. We invoke poet Anne Sexton for describing that untamable, eternal, gut-driven ha-ha and lucky love. We invoke one former minister of this church, Gordon Drought, who served here in the early 80s. Reverend Drought, we're told, used to hold an annual clown service during which he'd lead the Sunday worship service dressed in full clown costume. Tom was not too keen with this idea when the worship ministry suggested it to him. Let us invoke the spirit of laughter and love, playfulness and silliness, foolishness and joyfulness as we worship together this morning. Come, let us worship together. So our, our exploration of the fool this morning is broken into three parts. And, and the first part is I'm going to talk about, about foolishness and justice making. And in the second part, I'm going to talk about foolishness in love. And then in the third part, I'm going to tell a story, um, an, an old Italian folktale about faith. So a bunch of years ago, I edited this book that was published through the Unitarian Universalist Association. There had been this conference where the UUA had invited 12 ministers in kind of thriving ministries to come and spend a, a weekend together kind of talking about their own experiences and sharing their, their wisdom. And I was one of those 12. And then after the conference, I got a phone call asking me if I would put together essays by all of the, of the conference participants on um, kind of effectiveness in ministry. And so I did that, and I, I looked back through the notes of the conference, and one of the topics that came up during the conference was, was power. And um, the, the, it was sort of thrown out there that the leaders of successful churches kind of understand power and use it effectively. And so I was putting together this book, and I wanted to include a chapter about power. And so I looked at the, the participants, and, and it became clear to me who I know should get to write it. Um, there was a, a very, very esteemed UU minister named Marilyn Sewell, um, and she was serving our church in Portland. And during, during her tenure there, the church had more than doubled in size to, to over 1,000 members. And has anyone ever met, met Marilyn Sewell and heard of her? She is centered, self-possessed, and exudes this sense of power and authority. And so I called her up, which, which actually wasn't easy because I was actually intimidated by her and, and said, Marilyn, would, would you write a chapter for my book? A few months later, she sent me the draft of her essay on power. And, and I, kn I didn't know what I was expecting, but I, I opened up the file, and there it is, her essay on power and it begins with a story about naked protesting, which was not at all what I was expecting. So here's the story. Here's the story that she tells, not her. So this is the story she tells. Back during the days of the British Empire, when, when the British Empire had, had conquered parts of Africa, the, had, uh, the British Empire had conquered uh, northern Rhodesia, what's now modern-day Zimbabwe. And using Gandhi's teachings of nonviolent resistance, the, the people of, of Zimbabwe had 
sort of refused to cooperate with the British, had, had protested and had committed to civil disobedience as, as a way to challenge that, um, that immoral authority of the colonizers. After putting up with this resistance for several months, the British government decided, you know what we're going to do? We're going to send them the meanest, strictest, most severe administrator that we can to administrate this colony. So they found this tough administrator and sent him there. His plane lands, and he steps off onto the, the stairs heading down the plane, and there to greet him is a welcome party. Julia Chickamanega, who was a organizer, had recruited more than a thousand women who came completely naked to sing songs and dance dances of welcome <laughs> for the new colonial leader. He turned around, walked back onto the plane, and told the pilot to fly him back to London. Marilyn explains, this is a story about power, not the power of empire with its wealth and military might. This is a story about another kind of power, the power of a people who just say no, who choose not to cooperate with their oppressors. And it's about the power of using ingenuity and humor, the informal power of the people, to turn the tables on the colonizer. That tough-minded administrator gets played for a fool by those organizers. They fooled him. They clowned him. On the front of your order of service, there's a picture of a different sort of fool. Um, the two women on the front of your order of service, they're named Carmen Barsity and Kay Jorgensen. Carmen is on the left. She is a Catholic nun of the Franciscan order. And Kay on the right is a Unitarian Universalist minister. And together they run the Faithful Fools Street Ministry in San Francisco. Faithful Fools serves the homeless population of the Tenderloin in San Francisco. And the ministry that they do includes accompaniment, advocacy, arts, and education. And by education, she doesn't mean the, ed the education of homeless people, the education of people of privilege in what the experience of being on the streets is like. An article written about them said, Kay and Carmen call themselves fools because the jester or fool is someone who lives without boundaries, someone of no social standing whatsoever, but who can go anywhere and say anything. And so it is that when a new member joins the board of the Faithful Fools Ministry, they get as training on how to be a board member a book called Trickster Makes the World, where um, it is explained that the trickster is one who travels a spirit road. Trickster is a boundary cr crosser the author of the great distance between heaven and earth. Fools for justice are those who participate in the reversal of power, those who challenge the boundaries that separate people one from another. So that is the uh, first lesson on foolishness. And um, now our choir is going to sing a really amazing piece. So we move from Haitian sacred music to the crooners of the 50s. When my minister growing up preached his fool sermon, what kind of fool am I, are you? He began his sermon <clears throat> by listing a lot of different songs with the word fool in the title. There's fools rush in, a fool never learns, why do fools fall in love? And in total, he listed 29 different songs with the word fool in the title. Especially impressive because this sermon was given long before the days of Google, when you could easily find out that those songs easily. Of course, there were some songs that he foolishly didn't think to mention. I don't know why he didn't think to mention Aretha Franklin's Chain of Fools, Chain, 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 or The Who's Won't Get Fooled Again. 
His sermon was from many years ago, and in subsequent years, the fool would only continue to be a common theme throughout popular music. My favorite fool song, by the way, came out in 1996. It was a one-hit wonder by the band The Cardigans. It's a song called Love Fool. Love me, love me, say that you love me. Anyone remember that one? Yeah, a few, a few hands. All right, this is, dates me, I guess. What's striking, though, is that of the 29 songs my childhood minister named and the dozens more that I found with the help of Google, a significant percentage of them are love songs. And while some of those love songs are filled with a sense of regret or embarrassment or heartbreak, most of them are not. Most of them envy the fool. The fool is someone to be envied, someone we should almost aspire to become. In love, I hope to become a fool. The 19th century British novelist William Thackeray wrote, Love makes fools of us all, big and small. And in thinking about love and foolishness, I was drawn to the work of a writer, a psychologist named Brene Brown. Um, she's the author of books like The Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, and Rising Strong. And her research, her psychological research, centers around people who she uh, calls wholehearted. One of the characteristics of a wholehearted person, according to her, is that they have a tendency to cultivate laughter, song, and dance. They're able to let go of being cool and let go of always having to be in control. What Brene Brown found in her research into wholehearted living was that there was a connection between being wholehearted and being vulnerable. She writes, the wholehearted identify vulnerability as the catalyst for courage, compassion, and connection. In fact, it's the willingness to be vulnerable that emerged to me as the clearest value shared by all of the women and men whom I would describe as wholehearted. I was, I was very into Brene Brown's research, and once I, I read all of her books and decided that I was going to preach a sermon about daring greatly and being, being vulnerable. And so I, I got up into the pulpit and I preached to my congregation a sermon about vulnerability, and everybody, everybody thought it was a good sermon. That's, that's what they, they told me. And then afterwards, I, I got an email um, from a, like outside from a UU magazine that said, we heard you preached on vulnerability. Would you be willing to send us your sermon so that we might publish it? And I thought, ah, that's, that's pretty good. So I, so I sent it off, and they, they published excerpts from it, and they said, um, for, this, for this issue, um, we thought we would, we would contact people who, who aren't good at vulnerability and ask them to write about it, and, and which, was, which was news to me. Um, made me feel like the fool... But that's the point. That is the point. It is, as Brene Brown describes, and, and we know, it is that ability in, of, of love that says we don't have to be cool, we don't have to be defensed, we don't have to be in control of everything, that it's actually we can be vulnerable, we can put down our defenses. We can show our, our warts. We can show our difficult times. That love actually puts us into that connection with the sides of ourselves, the sides of ourselves um, that are vulnerable and allows us to actually make ourselves, a f make f kind of fools of ourselves with and for another person. Um, our capacity, our human capacity for laughter and our human capacity for love are actually, are actually connected. All creatures that love also laugh. All creatures that laugh also love. And so it is that willingness to be foolish that is a sign of our ability to love. We'll have our offertory and then uh, part three. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to tell a, a story. This is a um, story that's an Italian folk tale um, and then was, was rewritten during the Renaissance. <clears throat> and it was given 
uh, a Catholic twist to it, and it's, it's one of my, my favorite stories. It's based on uh, the, the children's book called The Clown of God, um, which is retold by Tommy De Paolo. So if you've ever, um, if you've ever read that to children, you're, you're familiar with it. The story involves a small village in Italy where there's a poor uh, child on the street named Giovanni. Giovanni is poor, wears dirty, tattered clothes, and his life depends on the goodwill of others in the village. He had an arrangement with one of the um, uh, with one of the vendors in the market. Giovanni had one skill, which was he could juggle, and so he would go to the market and he would juggle apples and lemons and oranges an eggplant, and sometimes even a zucchini. And the crowd would gather around to watch him juggle. And then after his performance, they would buy food from at the market. And uh, the wife of the, the shop owner at the market would, would give him some soup and some bread for his meal. This arrangement worked pretty well for Giovanni. But one day, a traveling circus came through the town And Giovanni went and was amazed by the acrobats and the dancers and the singers and all of the people in the traveling circus. Giovanni went to the leader of the circus and begged, said, I want to come on the road with you. And they said, well, you're just a little boy. We don't don't need you. And he said, oh, but I can juggle. And picked up some lemons and some oranges and juggled them. And the circus owner said, you're, you're not that good, but, but we see hope in you, and so come along. And Giovanni diligently apprenticed and became one of the most well-known jugglers throughout all of Italy, who juggle flaming tor- torches and spin plates. And his grand finale in every act was always the same. He would start with three balls, red orange and yellow and juggle them, and then he would add in a fourth ball, a green one, and a fifth, a blue one, and a sixth, a purple one, and juggle the rainbow, and then he would add in a seventh, a gold ball that he called the sun ball, and as he juggled them, he would throw the sun ball higher and higher and higher into the air and catch it, finally, as the finale. Giovanni became a great juggler and was well-known, and so much he could, he could trade in his dirty and tattered clothes for, for bright finery, befitting anyone who travels with the circus. And one day while he was traveling from village to village, he ran across some traveling monks who approached him to beg for food. Giovanni remembered when he, too, was a beggar for food, and gladly gave, gladly gave as much as they could eat to the monks. The monks told Giovanni how they went from town to town, begging their food and spreading the word of God. Our founder, Brother Francis, they said, says that everything sings, everything in all of creation sings of the glory of God. Even your juggling, Giovanni, sings of God's glory. Giovanni dismissed this, saying, I, I only juggle to make People laugh and applaud and feel good. It's the same thing, the monks said. If you give happiness to people, you give glory to God as well. So Giovanni continued on and continued on as a juggler until he began to grow old. And as he grew old, his juggling became less skilled. He began to drop from time to time, and eventually he had to give up on that gold ball and the purple ball and the green and the blue to where he could just juggle a few and not very well. The crowds at that point, they began to, rather than cheer and applaud and swoon as they had, they began to to boo and, and tease and say, why why you fool, why why would we why would we want to see a washed up juggler like you? And so it is that the donations stopped coming in. His clothes grew more tattered, 
and eventually he was forced to return to his home village, penniless. He came into his old village late one night, and the only building open was the church. So he went in and laid down on a pew in the back and fell asleep. The next morning, he woke up to the singing of Gloria, Gloria. It was a festival day. And there at the front of the church, a procession came bearing gifts to place before the icon of Jesus and the Virgin Mary. All of the people in the village came in bearing food and wonderful gifts to place before the icon. Giovanni, sitting in the back, thought this was beautiful, but he also felt a sort of a tinge of, of shame. And once the crowd had left after the festival, he thought to himself, he said, how I wish I am just a poor man. I have nothing. I have no gift to share and no gift to bring. And then he had a thought, well, perhaps, perhaps I could juggle. And so one last time, he took out the red and the orange and the yellow, added in the green and the blue, somehow added in the purple and finally the gold, and juggled them before the icon. At this point, some of the priests of the church came in and they saw this stranger juggling in the front of the church. And the priests looked to each other, what, what is he doing? Well, that is sacrilege. And at that point, when, when they said that, he had his concentration broken and he looked back and saw them and the balls dropped. And he ran out from the church, never to be seen again. The priests came forward to the altar to investigate. And there, that icon of Mary and Jesus, it had been designed with them with an emotionless face. But a miracle occurred. And each Jesus, the baby Jesus, and the Virgin Mary were there with bright smiles on their face. That is the, uh, the story, the old uh, Renaissance story of the clown of God.